Section 29 of the Works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume 3 by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Was it a dream? I had loved her madly. Why does one love? Why does one love? How queer it is to see only one being in the world, to have only one thought in one's mind only one desire in the heart, and only one name on the lips, a name which comes up continually, which rises like the water in a spring, from the depths of the soul, which rises to the lips, and which one repeats over and over again, which one whispers ceaselessly, everywhere, like a prayer. I am going to tell you our story, for love only has one, which is always the same. I met her and loved her, that is all, and for a whole year I have lived on her tenderness, on her caresses, in her arms, in her dresses, on her words, so completely wrapped up, bound, imprisoned in everything which came from her, that I no longer knew whether it was day or night, if I was dead or alive, on this old earth of ours, or elsewhere. And then she died. How? I do not know. I no longer know. But one evening she came home wet, for it was raining heavily, and the next day she coughed, and she coughed for about a week, and took to her bed. What happened I do not remember now, but doctors came, wrote, and went away. Medicines were brought, and some women made her drink them. Her hands were hot, her forehead was burning and her eyes bright and sad. When I spoke to her she answered me, but I do not remember what we said. I have forgotten everything, everything, everything. She died, and I very well remember her slight, feeble sigh. The nurse said, Ah, and I understood. I understood. I knew nothing more, nothing, I saw a priest who said, Your mistress? And it seemed to me as if he were insulting her. As she was dead, nobody had the right to know that any longer, and I turned him out. Another came who was very kind and tender, and I shed tears when he spoke to me about her. They consulted me about the funeral, but I do not remember anything that they said, though I recollected the coffin and the sound of the hammer when they nailed her down in it. Oh, God, God. She was buried, buried, she, in that hole. Some people came, female friends. I made my escape and ran away. I ran, and then I walked through the streets and went home, and the next day I started on a journey. Yesterday I returned to Paris, and when I saw my room again, our room, our bed, our furniture, everything that remains of the life of a human being after death, I was seized by such a violent attack of fresh grief that I was very near opening the window and throwing myself out into the street. As I could not remain any longer among these things between these walls which had enclosed and sheltered her, and which retained a thousand atoms of her, of her skin and of her breath in their imperceptible crevices, I took up my hat to make my escape, and just as I reached the door, I passed the large glass in the hall, which she had put there so that she might be able to look at herself every day, from head to foot, as she went out, to see if her toilette looked well and was correct and pretty, from her little boots to her bonnet and I stopped short in front of that looking-glass, in which she had so often been reflected. So often, so often, that it also must have retained her reflection. I was standing there, trembling with my eyes fixed on the glass, on that flat, profound, empty glass, which had contained her entirely, and had possessed her as much as I had, as my passionate looks had. I felt as if I loved that glass. I touched it. It was cold. Oh, the recollection. Sorrowful mirror. Burning mirror. Horrible mirror. 
which makes us suffer such torments happy are the men whose hearts forget everything that it has contained everything that has passed before it everything that has looked at itself in it that has been reflected in its affection in its love how i suffer i went on without knowing it without wishing it i went towards the cemetery i found her simple grave a white marble cross with these few words she loved was loved and died she is there below decayed how horrible i sobbed with my forehead on the ground and i stopped there for a long time a long time then i saw that it was getting dark and a strange a mad wish the wish of a despairing lover seized me i wished to pass the night the last night in weeping on her grave but i should have been seen and driven out how was i to manage i was cunning and got up and began to roam about in that city of the dead i walked and walked how small this city is in comparison with the other the city in which we live and yet how much more numerous the dead are than the living we want high houses wide streets and much room for the four generations who see the daylight at the same time drink water from the spring and wine from the vines and eat the bread from the plains and for all the generations of the dead for all that ladder of humanity that has descended down to us there is scarcely anything afield scarcely anything the earth takes them back oblivion effaces them adieu at the end of the abandoned cemetery i suddenly perceived that the one where those who have been dead a long time finish mingling with the soil where the crosses themselves decay where the last comers will be put to-morrow it is full of untended roses of strong and dark cypress trees a sad and beautiful garden nourished on human flesh i was alone perfectly alone and so i crouched in a green tree and hid myself there completely among the thick and sombre branches and i waited clinging to the stem like a shipwrecked man does to a plank when it was quite dark i left my refuge and began to walk softly slowly inaudibly through that ground full of dead people and i wandered about for a long time but could not find her again i went on with extended arms knocking against the tombs with my hands my feet my knees my chest even my head without being able to find her i touched and felt about like a blind man groping his way i felt the stones the crosses the iron railings the metal wreaths and the wreaths of faded flowers i read the names with my fingers by passing them over the letters what a night what a night i could not find her again there was no moon what a night i am frightened horribly frightened in these narrow paths between two rows of graves 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 nothing but graves on my right on my left in front of me around me everywhere there were graves i sat down on one of them for i could not walk any longer my knees were so weak i could hear my heart beat and i could hear something else as well what a confused nameless noise was the noise in my head in the impenetrable night or beneath the mysterious earth the earth sown with human corpses i looked all around me but i cannot say how long i remained there i was paralyzed with terror drunk with fright ready to shout out ready to die suddenly it seemed to me as if the slab of marble on which i was sitting was moving certainly it was moving as if it were being raised with a bound i sprang onto the neighboring tomb and i saw yes i distinctly saw the stone which i had just quitted rise upright 
and the dead person appeared, a naked skeleton, which was pushing the stone back with its bent back. I saw it quite clearly, although the night was so dark. On the cross I could read, Here lies Jacques Ollivant, who died at the age of fifty-one. He loved his family, was kind and honorable, and died in the grace of the Lord. The dead man also read what was inscribed on his tombstone. Then he picked up a stone off the path, a little pointed stone, and began to scrape the letters carefully. He slowly effaced them all together, and with the hollows of his eyes he looked at the places where they had been engraved, and with the tip of the bone that had been his forefinger, he wrote in luminous letters, like those lines which one traces on walls with the tip of a lucifer match, here reposes Jacques Ollivant, who died at the age of fifty-one. He hastened his father's death by his unkindness, as he wished to inherit his fortune. He tortured his wife, tormented his children, deceived his neighbors, robbed everyone he could, and died wretched. When he had finished writing, the dead man stood motionless, looking at his work and on turning round I saw that all the graves were open, that all the dead bodies had emerged from them, and that all had effaced the lies inscribed on the gravestones by their relations, and had substituted the truth instead, and I saw that all had been tormentors of their neighbors, malicious, dishonest, hypocrites, liars, rogues, calumniators, envious, that they had stolen, deceived, performed every disgraceful, every abominable action. These good fathers, these faithful wives, these devoted sons, these chaste daughters, these honest tradesmen, these men and women who were called irreproachable, and they were called irreproachable, and they were all writing at the same time, on the threshold of their eternal abode, the truth, the terrible and the holy truth, which everybody is ignorant of, or pretends to be ignorant of, while the others are alive. I thought that she also must have written something on her tombstone, and now, running without any fear among the half-open coffins, among the corpses and skeletons, I went towards her, sure that I should find her immediately. I recognized her at once without seeing her face which was covered by the winding sheet, and on the marble cross where shortly before I had read she loved, was loved, and died, I now saw, having gone out one day in order to deceive her lover, she caught cold in the rain and died. It appears that they found me at daybreak, lying on the grave, unconscious. End of section 29 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 30 of The Works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume 3, by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Last Step. Monsieur de saint jury would not have deceived his old mistress for anything in the world, perhaps from an instinctive fear that he had heard of adventures that turn out badly, make a noise, and bring about hateful family quarrels, crises from which one emerges enervated and exasperated with destiny, and, as it were, with the weight of a bullet on one's feet, and also from his requirement for a calm, sheep-like existence, whose monotony was never disturbed by any shock and perhaps from the remains of the love which had so entirely made him, during the first years of their connection, the slave of the proud, dominating beauty, and of the enthralling charm of that woman. He kept out of the way of temptation almost timidly, and was faithful to her, and as submissive as a spaniel. He paid her every attention, did not appear to notice that the outlines of her figure, which had formerly been so harmonious and supple, were getting too full and puffy, that her face, which used to remind him of a blush rose, was getting wrinkled, and that her eyes were getting dull. He admired her in spite of everything, almost blindly, 
and clothed her with imaginary charms with an autumnal beauty with the majestic and serene softness of an october twilight and with the last blossoms which unfold by the side of the walks strewn with dead leaves but although their connection had lasted for many years though they were as closely bound to each other as if they had been married and although charlotte guindal pestered him with entreaties and upset him with continual quarrels on the subject and in spite of the fact that he believed her to be absolutely faithful to him and worthy of his most perfect confidence and love yet m de saint jury had never been able to make up his mind to give her his name and to put their false position on a legal footing he really suffered from this but remained firm and defended his position quibbled sought for subterfuges replied by the eternal and vague what would be the good of it which nearly sent charlotte mad made her furious and caused her to say angry and ill-tempered things but he remained passive and listless with his back bent like a restive horse under the whip he asked her whether it was really necessary to their happiness as they had no children did not everybody think that they were married was not she everywhere called madame de saint jury and had their servants any doubt that they were in the service of respectable married people was not the name which had been transmitted to a man from father to son intact honored and often with a halo of glory round it a sacred trust which no one had a right to touch what would she gain if she bore it legitimately did she for a moment suppose that she would rise higher in people's estimation and be more admitted into society or that people would forget that she had been his regular mistress before becoming his wife did not everybody know that formerly before he rescued her from that bohemian life in which she had been waiting for her chance in vain and was losing her good looks charlotte guindal frequented all the public balls and showered her legs liberally at the moulin rouge charlotte knew his crabbed though also kindly character which was at the same time logical and obstinate too well to hope that she would ever be able to overcome his opposition and scruples except by some clever woman's trick some well-acted scene in a comedy so she appeared to be satisfied with his reasons and to renounce her bauble and outwardly she showed an equable and conciliatory temper and no longer worried m de saint jury with her recriminations and thus the time went by in calm monotony without fruitless battles or fierce assaults charlotte guindal's medical man was dr rabatel one of those clever men who appear to know everything but whom a country bone-setter would reduce to a why by a few questions one of those men who wish to impress everybody with their apparent value and who make use of their medical knowledge as if it were some productive commercial house which carried on a suspicious business who can scent out those persons whom they can manage as they please as if they were a piece of soft wax who keep them in a continual state of terror by keeping the idea of death constantly before their eyes they soon manage to obtain the mastery over such persons scrutinize their consciences as well as the cleverest priest could do make sure of being well paid for their complicity as soon as they have obtained a footing anywhere and drain their patience of their secrets in order to use them as a weapon for extorting money on occasions he felt sure immediately that this middle-aged lady wanted something of him as by some extraordinary perversion of taste he was rather fond of the remains of a good-looking woman if they were well got up and offered to him of that high flavor which arises from soft lips which had been made tender through years of love from gray hair powdered with gold from a body engaged in its last struggle and which dreams of one more victory before abdicating power altogether he did not hesitate to become his new patient's lover when winter came however a thorough change took place in charlotte's health that had hitherto been so good she had no strength left she felt ill after the slightest exertion complained of internal pains and spent whole days lying on the couch with set eyes and without uttering a word so that everybody thought that she was dying of one of those mysterious maladies which cannot be coped with but which by degrees undermines the whole system 
it was sad to see her rapidly sinking lying motionless on her pillows while a mist seemed to have come over her eyes and her hands lay helplessly on the bed and her mouth seemed sealed by some invisible finger monsieur de saint jury was in despair he cried like a child and he suffered as if somebody had plunged a knife into him when the doctor said to him in his unctuous voice i know that you are a brave man my dear sir and i may venture to tell you the whole truth madame de saint jury is doomed irrevocably doomed nothing but a miracle can save her and alas there are no miracles in these days the end is only a question of a few hours and may come quite suddenly Monsieur de saint jury had thrown himself into a chair and was sobbing bitterly covering his face with his hands my poor dear my poor darling he said through his tears pray compose yourself and be brave the doctor continued sitting down by his side for i have to say something serious to you and to convey to you our poor patient's last wishes a few minutes ago she told me the secret of your double life and of your connection with her and now in view of death which she feels approaching so rapidly for she is under no delusion the unhappy woman wishes to die at peace with heaven with the consolation of having regulated her equivocal position and of having become your wife monsieur de saint jury sat upright with a bewildered look while he moved his hands nervously in his grief he was incapable of manifesting any will of his own or of opposing this unexpected attack oh anything that charlotte wishes doctor anything and i will myself go and tell her so on my knees the wedding took place discreetly with something funeral about it in the darkened room where the words which were spoken had a strange sound almost of anguish charlotte who was lying in bed with her eyes dilated through happiness had put both trembling hands into those of monsieur de saint jury and she seemed to expire with the word yes on her lips the doctor looked at the moving scene grave and impassive with his chin buried in his white cravat and his two arms resting on the mantelpiece while his eyes twinkled behind his glasses the next week madame de saint jury began to get better and that wonderful recovery about which monsieur de saint jury tells everybody with effusive gratitude who will listen to him has so increased dr rabatel's reputation that at the next election he will be made a member of the academy of medicine End of section 30. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 31 of the Works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume 3, by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Will i knew that tall young fellow rene de bourneval he was an agreeable man though of a rather melancholy turn of mind who seemed prejudiced against everything very sceptical and able to tear worldly hypocrisies to pieces he often used to say there are no honourable men or at any rate they only appear so when compared to low people he had two brothers whom he never saw the Messrs. de Courcils, and I thought they were by another father, on account of the difference in the name. I had frequently heard that something strange had happened in the family, but I did not know the details. As I took a great liking to him, we soon became intimate, and one evening, when I had been dining with him alone, I asked him by chance, Are you by your mother's first or second marriage? He grew rather pale and then flushed, and did not speak for a few moments he was visibly embarrassed then he smiled in a melancholy and gentle manner which was peculiar to him and said my dear friend if it will not weary you i can give you some very strange particulars about my life i know that you are a sensible man so i do not fear that our friendship will suffer by my revelations and should it suffer i should not care about having you for my friend any longer my mother madame de courcils was a poor little timid woman 
whom her husband had married for the sake of her fortune and her whole life was one of martyrdom of a loving delicate mind she was constantly being ill-treated by the man who ought to have been my father one of those bores called country gentlemen a month after their marriage he was living with a servant and besides that the wives and daughters of his tenants were his mistresses which did not prevent him from having three children by his wife or three if you count me in my mother said nothing and lived in that noisy house like a little mouse set aside disparaged nervous she looked at people with her bright uneasy restless eyes the eyes of some terrified creature which can never shake off its fear and yet she was pretty very pretty and fair a gray blonde as if her hair had lost its color through her constant fears among monsieur de courcil's friends who constantly came to the chateau there was an ex-cavalry officer a widower a man who was feared who was at the same time tender and violent capable of the most energetic resolutions monsieur de bourneval whose name i bear he was a tall thin man with a heavy black moustache and i am very like him he was a man who had read a great deal and whose ideas were not like those of most of his class his great-grandmother had been a friend of j j rousseau's and one might have said that he had inherited something of this ancestral connection he knew the contrat social and the nouveau eloise by heart and all those philosophical books which long beforehand prepared the overthrow of our old usages prejudices superannuated laws and imbecile morality it seems that he loved my mother and she loved him but their intrigue was carried on so secretly that no one guessed it the poor neglected unhappy woman must have clung to him in a despairing manner and in her intimacy with him must have imbibed all his ways of thinking theories of free thought audacious ideas of independent love but as she was so timid that she never ventured to speak aloud it was all driven back condensed and expressed in her heart which never opened itself my two brothers were very hard towards her like their father was and never gave her a caress and used to seeing her count for nothing in the house they treated her rather like a servant and so i was the only one of her sons who really loved her and whom she loved when she died i was seventeen and i must add in order that you may understand what follows that there had been a lawsuit between my father and my mother and that their property had been separated to my mother's advantage as thanks to the tricks of the law and the intelligent devotion of a lawyer to her interests she had preserved the right of making her will in favor of any one she pleased we were told that there was a will lying at the lawyers and were invited to be present at the reading of it i can remember it as if it were yesterday it was a grand dramatic burlesque surprising scene brought about by the posthumous revolt of that dead woman by that cry for liberty that claim from the depths of her tomb of that martyred woman who had been crushed by our habits during her life and who from her closed tomb uttered a despairing appeal for independence the man who thought that he was my father a stout ruddy-faced man who gave everyone the idea of a butcher and my brothers two great fellows of twenty and twenty-two were waiting quietly in their chairs monsieur de bourneval who had been invited to be present came in and stood behind me he was very pale and bit his moustache which was turning gray no doubt he was prepared for what was going to happen and the lawyer double-locked the door and began to read the will after having opened the envelope which was sealed with red wax and whose contents he was ignorant of in our presence my friend stopped suddenly and got up and from his writing table he took an old paper unfolded it kissed it and then continued this is the will of my beloved mother i the undersigned anne catherine genevieve matilda de Coilieu, the legitimate wife of leopold joseph goutran de courcils sound in body and mind here express my last wishes i first of all ask god and then my dear son rene to pardon me for the act i am about to commit 
i believe that my child's heart is great enough to understand me and to forgive me i have suffered my whole life long i was married out of calculation then despised misunderstood oppressed and constantly deceived by my husband i forgive him but i owe him nothing my eldest sons never loved me never spoilt me scarcely treated me as a mother but during my whole life i was everything that i ought to have been and i owe them nothing more after my death the ties of blood cannot exist without daily and constant affection an ungrateful son is less than a stranger he is a culprit for he has no right to be indifferent towards his mother i have always trembled before men before their unjust laws their inhuman customs their shameful prejudices before god i have no longer any fear dead i fling aside disgraceful hypocrisy i dare to speak my thoughts and to avow and to sign the secret of my heart i therefore leave that part of my fortune of which the law allows me to dispose as a deposit with my dear lover pierre genet simon de bourneval to revert afterwards to our dear son rene this wish is moreover formulated more precisely in a notarial deed and i declare before the supreme judge who hears me that i should have cursed heaven and my own existence if i had not met my lover's deep devoted tender unshaken affection if i had not felt in his arms that the creator made his creatures to love sustain and console each other and to weep together in the hours of sadness monsieur de courcils is the father of my two eldest sons rene alone owes his life to monsieur de bourneval i pray to the master of men and of their destinies to place father and son above social prejudices to make them love each other until they die and to love me also in my coffin these are my last thoughts and my last wish matilda de croleur monsieur de courcils had arisen and he cried it is the will of a madwoman then monsieur de bourneval stepped forward and said in a loud and penetrating voice i simon de bourneval solemnly declare that this writing contains nothing but the strict truth and i am ready to prove it by letters which i possess on hearing that monsieur de courcils went up to him and i thought they were going to collar each other there they stood both of them tall one stout and the other thin both trembling my mother's husband stammered out you are a worthless wretch and the other replied in a loud dry voice we will meet somewhere else monsieur i should have already slapped your ugly face and challenged you a long time ago if i had not before everything else thought of the peace of mind of that poor woman whom you made suffer so much during her lifetime then turning to me he said you are my son will you come with me i have no right to take you away but i shall assume it if you will kindly come with me i shook his hand without replying and we went out together i was certainly three parts mad two days later monsieur de bourneval killed monsieur de courcils in a duel my brothers fearing some terrible scandal held their tongues and i offered them and they accepted half the fortune which my mother had left me i took my real father's name renouncing that which the law gave me but which was not really mine monsieur de bourneval died three years afterwards and i have not consoled myself yet he rose from his chair walked up and down the room and standing in front of me he said well i say that my mother's will was one of the most beautiful and loyal as well as one of the grandest acts that a woman could perform do you not think so i gave him both my hands most certainly i do my friend end of section thirty one recording by james k white chula vista Section 32 of the Works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume 3, by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A Country Excursion. 
for five months they had been talking of going to lunch at some country restaurant in the neighborhood of paris on madame dufour's birthday and as they were looking forward very impatiently to the outing they had got up very early that morning monsieur dufour had borrowed the milkman's tilted cart and drove himself it was a very tidy two-wheeled conveyance with a hood and in it the wife resplendent in a wonderful sherry-colored silk dress sat by the side of her husband the old grandmother and a girl were accommodated with two chairs and a boy with yellow hair was lying at the bottom of the trap of whom however nothing was to be seen except his head when they got to the bridge of neuilly monsieur dufour said here we are in the country at last and at that signal his wife had grown sentimental about the beauties of nature when they got to the crossroads at courbevoie they were seized with admiration for the distant horizon down there on the right was the spire of argentui church and above it rose the hills of sanois and the mill of orgamont while on the left the aqueduct of marly stood out against the clear morning sky and in the distance they could see the terrace of saint germain and opposite to them at the end of a low chain of hills the new fort of cormeilles quite in the distance a very long way off beyond the plains and villages one could see the sombre green of the forests the sun was beginning to shine in their faces the dust got into their eyes and on either side of the road there stretched an interminable tract of bare ugly country which smelt unpleasantly one might have thought that it had been ravaged by the pestilence which had even attacked the buildings for skeletons of dilapidated and deserted houses or small cottages which were left in an unfinished state as the contractors had not been paid reared their four roofless walls on each side here and there tall factory chimneys rose up from the barren soil the only vegetation on that putrid land where the spring breezes wafted an odor of petroleum and schist which was mingled with another smell that was even still less agreeable at last however they crossed the seine a second time and it was delightful on the bridge the river sparkled in the sun and they had a feeling of quiet satisfaction and enjoyment in drinking in the purer air that was not impregnated by the black smoke of factories nor by the miasma from the deposits of night soil a man whom they met told them that the name of the place was besance and so monsieur dufour pulled up and read the attractive announcement outside an eating-house restaurant poulon stews and fried fish private rooms arbors and swings well madame dufour will this suit you will you make up your mind at last she read the announcement in her turn and then looked at the house for a time it was a white country inn built by the roadside and through the open door she could see the bright zinc of the counter at which two workmen out for the day were sitting at last she made up her mind and said yes this will do and besides there is a view so they drove into a large yard with trees in it behind the inn which was only separated from the river by the towing path and got out the husband sprang out first and then held out his arms for his wife and as the step was very high madame dufour in order to reach him had to show the lower part of her limbs whose former slenderness had disappeared in fat the monsieur dufour who was already getting excited by the country air pinched her calf and then taking her in his arms he set her onto the ground as if she had been some enormous bundle she shook the dust out of the silk dress and then looked round to see in what sort of place she was she was a stout woman of about thirty-six full-blown and delightful to look at she could hardly breathe as her stays were laced too tightly and their pressure forced the heaving mass of her superabundant bosom up to her double chin next the girl put her hand onto her father's shoulder and jumped lightly out the boy with the yellow hair had got down by stepping on the wheel and he helped monsieur dufour to get his grandmother out then they unharnessed the horse which they tied up to a tree 
and the carriage fell back with both shafts in the air the men took off their coats and washed their hands in a pail of water and then went and joined their ladies who had already taken possession of the swings mademoiselle dufour was trying to swing herself standing up but she could not succeed in getting a start she was a pretty girl of about eighteen one of those women who suddenly excite your desire when you meet them in the street and who leave you with a vague feeling of uneasiness and of excited senses she was tall had a small waist and large hips with a dark skin very large eyes and very black hair her dress clearly marked the outlines of her firm full figure which was accentuated by the motion of her hips as she tried to swing herself higher her arms were stretched over her head to hold the rope so that her bosom rose at every movement she made her hat which a gust of wind had blown off was hanging behind her and as the swing gradually rose higher and higher she showed her delicate limbs up to the knees each time and the wind from the petticoats which was more heady than the fumes of wine blew into the faces of the two men who were looking at her and smiling sitting on the other swing madame dufour kept saying in a monotonous voice cyprian come and swing me do come and swing me cyprian at last he went and turning up his shirt sleeves as if he intended to work very hard he with much difficulty set his wife in motion she clutched the two ropes and held her legs out straight so as not to touch the ground she enjoyed feeling giddy at the motion of the swing and her whole figure shook like a jelly on a dish but as she went higher and higher she grew too giddy and got frightened every time she was coming back she uttered a piercing scream which made all the little urchins come round and down below beneath the garden hedge she vaguely saw a row of mischievous heads who made various grimaces as they laughed when a servant girl came out they ordered lunch some fried fish a stewed rabbit salad and dessert madame dufour said with an important air bring two quarts of beer and a bottle of claret her husband said we will have lunch on the grass the girl added the grandmother who had an affection for cats had been running after one that belonged to the house and had been bestowing the most affectionate words on it for the last ten minutes the animal which was no doubt secretly flattered by her attentions kept close to the good woman but just out of reach of her hand and quietly walked round the trees against which she rubbed herself with her tail up and purring with pleasure hello the young man with the yellow hair who was ferreting about suddenly exclaimed here are two swell boats they all went to look at them and saw two beautiful skiffs in a wooden boathouse which were as beautifully finished as if they had been objects of luxury they were moored side by side like two tall slender girls in their narrow shining length and excited the wish to float in them on warm summer mornings and evenings along the bower-covered banks of the river where the trees dip their branches into the water where the rushes are continually rustling in the breeze and where the swift kingfishers dart about like flashes of blue lightning the whole family looked at them with great respect oh they are indeed two swell boats monsieur dufour repeated gravely and he examined them gravely and he examined them like a connoisseur he had been in the habit of rowing in his younger days he said and when he had that in his hands and he went through the action of pulling the oars he did not care a fig for anybody he had beaten more than one englishman formerly at the joinville regattas he grew quite excited at last and offered to make a bet that in a boat like that he could row six leagues an hour without exerting himself lunch is ready the waitress said appearing at the entrance to the boathouse so they all hurried off but two young men were already lunching at the best place which madame dufour had chosen in her mind as her seat no doubt they were the owners of the skiffs for they were dressed in boating costume they were stretched out almost lying on chairs and were sunburnt and had on flannel trousers and thin cotton jerseys with short sleeves 
which showed their bare arms, which were as strong as blacksmiths. They were two strong fellows, who thought a great deal of their vigor, and who showed in all their movements that elasticity and grace of the limbs which can only be acquired by exercise, and which is so different to the deformity with which the same continual work stamps the mechanic. They exchanged a rapid smile when they saw the mother, and then a look on seeing the daughter. Let us give up our place, one of them said. It will make us acquainted with them. The other got up immediately, and holding his black and red boating cap in his hand, he politely offered the ladies the only shady place in the garden. With many excuses they accepted, and so that it might be more rural, they sat on the grass, without either tables or chairs. The two young men took their plates, knives, forks, etc., to a table a little way off, and began to eat again, and their bare arms, which they showed continually, rather embarrassed the girl. She even pretended to turn her head aside, and not to see them, while Madame Dufour, who was rather bolder, tempted by feminine curiosity, looked at them every moment, and no doubt compared them with the secret unsightliness of her husband. She had squatted herself on the ground with her legs tucked under her, after the manner of tailors, and she kept wriggling about continually under the pretext that ants were crawling about her somewhere. Monsieur Dufour, whom the presence of strangers of politeness had put into rather a bad temper, was trying to find a comfortable position which he did not, however, succeed in doing. And the young man with the yellow hair was eating as silently as an ogre. It is lovely weather, monsieur, the stout lady said to one of the boating men. She wished to be friendly because they had given up their place. It is indeed, madame, he replied. Do you often go into the country? Oh, only once or twice a year, to get a little fresh air. And you, monsieur? I come and sleep here every night. Oh, that must be very nice. Certainly it is, madame. And he gave them such a practical account of his daily life that it gave rise in the hearts of these shopkeepers who were deprived of the meadows and who longed for country walks to that foolish love of nature which they all feel so strongly the whole year round behind the counter in their shop. The girl raised her eyes and looked at the oarsman with emotion, and Monsieur Dufour spoke for the first time. It is indeed a happy life, he said, and then he added, A little more rabbit, my dear? No, thank you, she replied, and turning to the young men again and pointing to their arms, asked, Do you never feel cold like that? They both began to laugh, and they frightened the family by the account of the enormous fatigue they could endure of their bathing while in a state of tremendous perspiration, of their rowing in the fog at night, and they struck their chests violently to show how they sounded. Ah, you look very strong, the husband said, who did not talk any more of the time when he used to beat the English. The girl was looking at them aside now, and the young fellow with the yellow hair was coughing violently as he had swallowed some wine the wrong way and bespattering Madame Dufour's cherry-coloured silk dress who got angry and sent for some water to wash the spots. Meanwhile it had grown unbearably hot. The sparkling river looked like a blaze of fire, and the fumes of the wine were getting into their heads. Monsieur Dufour, who had a violent hiccup, had unbuttoned his waistcoat and the top of his trousers, while his wife, who felt choking, was gradually unfastening her dress. The apprentice was shaking his yellow wig in a happy frame of mind, and kept helping himself to wine. And as the old grandmother felt drunk, she also felt very stiff and dignified. As for the girl, she showed nothing except a peculiar brightness in her eyes, while the brown skin on the cheeks became more rosy. The coffee finished them off. They spoke of singing, and each of them sang or repeated a couplet which the others repeated frantically. Then they got up with some difficulty, and while the two women, who were rather dizzy, were getting the fresh air, the two men, who were altogether drunk, were performing gymnastic tricks. Heavy, limp, and with scarlet faces, 
they hung awkwardly onto the iron rings without being able to raise themselves while their shirts were continually threatening to leave their trousers and to flap in the wind like flags meanwhile the two boating men had got their skiffs into the water and they came back and politely asked the ladies whether they would like a row would you like one monsieur dufour his wife exclaimed please come he merely gave her a drunken look without understanding what she said then one of the rowers came up with two fishing rods in his hand and the hope of catching a gudgeon that great aim of the parisian shopkeeper made dufour's dull eyes gleam and he politely allowed them to do whatever they liked while he sat in the shade under the bridge with his feet dangling over the river by the side of the young man with the yellow hair who was sleeping soundly close to him one of the boating men made a martyr of himself and took the mother let us go to the little wood on the ilo zenglia he called out as he rowed off the other skiff went slower for the rower was looking at his companion so intently that he thought of nothing else and his emotion paralyzed his strength while the girl who was sitting on the steerer's seat gave herself up to the enjoyment of being on the water she felt disinclined to think felt a lassitude in her limbs and a total abandonment of herself as if she were intoxicated and she had become very flushed and breathed shortly the effects of the wine which were increased by the extreme heat made all the trees on the bank seem to bow as she passed a vague wish for enjoyment and a fermentation for her blood seemed to pervade her whole body which was excited by the heat of the day and she was also agitated by this tete-a-tete -tete on the water in a place which seemed depopulated by the heat with this young man who thought her pretty whose looks seemed to caress her skin and whose looks were as penetrating and pervading as the sun's rays their inability to speak increased their emotion and they looked about them but at last he made an effort and asked her name henriette she said why my name is henri he replied the sound of their voices had calmed them and they looked at the banks the other skiff had passed them and seemed to be waiting for them and the rower called out we will meet you in the wood we are going as far as robinson's because madame dufour is thirsty then he bent over his oars again and rowed off so quickly that he was soon out of sight meanwhile a continual roar which they had heard for some time came nearer and the river itself seemed to shiver as if the dull noise were rising from its depths what is that noise she asked it was the noise of the ware which cut the river in two at the island and he was explaining it to her when above the noise of the waterfall they heard the song of a bird which seemed a long way off listen he said the nightingales are singing during the day so the females must be sitting a nightingale she had never heard one before and the idea of listening to one roused visions of poetic tenderness in her heart a nightingale that is to say the invisible witness of her lover's interview with juliet invoked on her balcony the celestial music which is attuned to human kisses that eternal inspirer of all those languorous romances which open an ideal sky to all the poor little tender hearts of sensitive girls she was going to hear a nightingale we must not make a noise her companion said and then we can go into the wood and sit down close to it the skiff seemed to glide they saw the trees on the island whose banks were so low that they could look into the depths of the thickets they stopped he made the boat fast henriette took hold of henri's arm and they went beneath the trees stop he said so she bent down and they went into an inextricable thicket of creepers leaves and reed grass which formed an impenetrable asylum and which the young man laughingly called his private room just above their heads perched in one of the trees which hid them the bird was still singing he uttered shakes and roulades and then long vibrating sounds that filled the air 
and seemed to lose themselves on the horizon across the level country through that burning silence which weighed upon the whole country round they did not speak for fear of frightening it away they were sitting close together and slowly henri's arm stole round the girl's waist and squeezed it gently she took that daring hand without any anger and kept removing it whenever he put it round her without however feeling at all embarrassed by this caress just as if it had been something quite natural which she was resisting just as naturally she was listening to the bird in ecstasy she felt an infinite longing for happiness for some sudden demonstration of tenderness for the revelation of superhuman poetry and she felt such a softening at her heart and relaxation of her nerves that she began to cry without knowing why and now the young man was straining her close to him and she did not remove his arm she did not think of it suddenly the nightingale stopped and a voice called out in the distance henriette do not reply he said in a low voice you will drive the bird away but she had no idea of doing so and they remained in the same position for some time madame dufour had sat down somewhere or other for from time to time they heard the stout lady break out into little bursts of laughter the girl was still crying she was filled with strange sensations henri's head was on her shoulder and suddenly he kissed her on the lips she was surprised and angry and to avoid him she stood up they were both very pale when they quitted their grassy retreat the blue sky looked dull to them and the ardent sun was clouded over to their eyes but they perceived not the solitude and silence they walked quickly side by side without speaking or touching each other for they appeared to be irreconcilable enemies as if disgust had sprung up between them and hatred between their souls and from time to time henriette called out mamma by and by they heard a noise in the thicket and the stout lady appeared looking rather confused and her companion's face was wrinkled with smiles which he could not check madame dufour took his arm and they returned to the boats and henri who was going on first still without speaking by the girl's side and at last they got back to besance monsieur dufour who had got sober was waiting for them very impatiently while the young man with the yellow hair was having a mouthful of something to eat before leaving the inn the carriage was in the yard with the horse in and the grandmother who had already got in was very frightened at the thought of being overtaken by night before they got back to paris as the outskirts were not safe they shook hands and the defour family drove off good-bye until we meet again the oarsman cried and the answer they got was a sigh and a tear two months later as henri was going along the rue des martyrs he saw dufour ironmonger over a door and so he went in and saw the stout lady sitting at the counter they recognized each other immediately and after an interchange of polite greetings he asked after them all and how is mademoiselle henriette he inquired specially very well thank you she is married ah but mastering his feelings he added whom was she married to to that young man who went with us you know he has joined us in business i remember him perfectly he was going out feeling very unhappy though scarcely knowing why when madame called him back and how is your friend she asked rather shyly he is very well thank you please give him our compliments and beg him to come and call when he is in the neighborhood she then added tell him it will give me great pleasure i will be sure to do so adieu i will not say that come again very soon the next year one very hot sunday all the details of that adventure which he had never forgotten suddenly came back to him so clearly that he returned to their room in the wood 
and he was overwhelmed with astonishment when he went in she was sitting on the grass looking very sad while by her side again in his shirt sleeves the young man with the yellow hair was sleeping soundly like some brute she grew so pale when she saw henri that at first he thought she was going to faint then however they began to talk quite naturally but when he told her that he was very fond of that spot and went there very often on sundays she looked into his eyes for a long time i too think of it she replied oh come my dear her husband said with a yawn i think it is time for us to be going end of section thirty two recording by james k white chula vista section thirty three of the works of guy de maupassant volume three by guy de maupassant this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by james k white chula vista the lancer's wife one it was after bourbaki's defeat in the east of france the army broken up decimated and worn out had been obliged to retreat into switzerland after that terrible campaign and it was only the short time that it lasted which saved a hundred and fifty thousand men from certain death hunger the terrible cold forced marches in the snow without boots over bad mountainous roads had caused us fronterers especially the greatest sufferings for we were without tents and almost without food always in front when we were marching towards belfort and in the rear when returning by the jura of our little band that had numbered twelve hundred men on the first of january there remained only twenty-two pale thin ragged wretches when we at length succeeded in reaching swiss territory there we were safe and could rest everybody knows what sympathy was shown to the unfortunate french army and how well it was cared for we all gained fresh life and those who had been rich and happy before the war declared that they had never experienced a greater feeling of comfort than they did then just think we actually had something to eat every day and could sleep every night meanwhile the war continued in the east of france which had been excluded from the armistice besancon still kept the enemy in check and the latter had their revenge by ravaging the france comte sometimes we heard that they had approached quite close to the frontier and we saw swiss troops who were to form a line of observation between us and them set out on their march that pained us in the end and as we regained health and strength the longing for fighting laid hold of us it was disgraceful and irritating to know that within two or three leagues of us the germans were victorious and insolent to feel that we were protected by our captivity and to feel that on that account we were powerless against them one day our captain took five or six of us aside and spoke to us about it long and furiously he was a fine fellow that captain he had been a sub-lieutenant in the zouaves was tall and thin and as hard as steel and during the whole campaign he had cut out their work for the germans he fretted in inactivity and could not accustom himself to the idea of being a prisoner and of doing nothing confound it he said to us does it not pain you to know that there is a number of uhlans within two hours of us does it not almost drive you mad to know that those beggarly wretches are walking about as masters in our mountains where six determined men might kill a whole spitful any day i cannot endure it any longer and i must go there but how can we manage captain how it is not very difficult just as if we had not done a thing or two within the last six months and got out of woods that were guarded by very different men from the swiss the day that you wish to cross over into france i will undertake to get you there that may be but what shall we do in france without any arms without arms we will get them over yonder by jove you are forgetting the treaty another soldier said 
we shall run the risk of doing the swiss an injury if monteufel learns that they have allowed prisoners to return to france come said the captain those are all bad reasons i mean to go and kill some prussians that is all i care about if you do not wish to do as i do well and good only say so at once i can quite well go by myself i do not require anybody's company naturally we all protested and as it was quite impossible to make the captain alter his mind we felt obliged to promise to go with him we liked him too much to leave him in the lurch as he never failed us in any extremity and so the expedition was decided on two the captain had a plan of his own that he had been cogitating over for some time a man in that part of the country whom he knew was going to lend him a cart and six suits of peasants clothes we could hide under some straw at the bottom of the wagon and it would be loaded with gruyere cheese which he was supposed to be going to sell in france the captain told the sentinels that he was taking two friends with him to protect his goods in case anyone should try to rob him which did not seem an extraordinary precaution a swiss officer seemed to look at the wagon in a knowing manner but that was in order to impress his soldiers in a word neither officers nor men could make it out get on the captain said to the horses as he cracked his whip while our three men quietly smoked their pipes i was half suffocated in my box which only admitted the air through those holes in front while at the same time i was nearly frozen for it was terribly cold get on the captain said again and the wagon loaded with gruyere cheese entered france the prussian lines were very badly guarded as the enemy trusted to the watchfulness of the swiss the sergeant spoke north german while our captain spoke the bad german of the four cantons and so they could not understand each other the sergeant however pretended to be very intelligent and in order to make us believe that he understood us they allowed us to continue our journey and after traveling for seven hours being continually stopped in the same manner we arrived at a small village of the jura in ruins at nightfall what were we going to do our only arms were the captain's whip our uniforms our peasants blouses and our food our gruyere cheese our sole riches consisted in our ammunition packets of cartridges which we had stowed away inside some of the huge cheeses we had about a thousand of them just two hundred each but then we wanted rifles and they must be chasseaux luckily however the captain was a bold man of an inventive mind and this was the plan that he hit upon while three of us remained hidden in a cellar in the abandoned village he continued his journey as far as besançon with the empty wagon and one man the town was invested but one can always make one's way into a town among the hills by crossing the tableland till within about ten miles of the walls and then by following paths and ravines on foot they left their wagon at omans among the germans and escaped out of it at night on foot so as to gain the heights which border the river du the next day they entered besançon where there were plenty of chasseaux there were nearly forty thousand of them left in the arsenal and general roland a brave marine laughed at the captain's daring project but let him have six rifles and wished him good luck there he had also found his wife who had been through all the war with us before the campaign in the east and who had been only prevented by illness from continuing with bourbaki's army she had recovered however in spite of the cold which was growing more and more intense and in spite of the numberless privations that awaited her she persisted in accompanying her husband he was obliged to give way to her and they all three the captain his wife and our comrade started on their expedition going was nothing in comparison to returning they were obliged to travel by night so as to avoid meeting anybody as the possession of six rifles would have made them liable to suspicion 
but in spite of everything a week after leaving us the captain and his two men were back with us again the campaign was about to begin three the first night of his arrival he began it himself and under the pretext of examining the country round he went along the high road i must tell you that the little village which served as our fortress was a small collection of poor badly built houses which had been deserted long before it lay on a steep slope which terminated in a wooded plain the country people sell the wood they send it down the ravines which are called coulees locally and which lead down to the plain and there they stack it into piles which they sell thrice a year to the wood merchants the spot where this market is held is indicated by two small houses by the side of the high road and which serve for public houses the captain had gone down there by one of these coulees he had been gone about half an hour and we were on the lookout at the top of the ravine when we heard a shot the captain had ordered us not to stir and only to come to him when we heard him blow his trumpet it was made of a goat's horn and could be heard a league off but it gave no sound and in spite of our cruel anxiety we were obliged to wait in silence without rifles by our side it is nothing to go down these coulees one need only let oneself glide down but it is more difficult to get up again one has to scramble up by catching hold of the hanging branches of the trees and sometimes on all fours by sheer strength a whole mortal hour passed and he did not come nothing moved in the brushwood the captain's wife began to grow impatient what could he be doing why did he not call us did the shot that we had heard proceed from an enemy and had he killed or wounded our leader her husband they did not know what to think but i myself fancied either that he was dead or that his enterprise was successful and i was merely anxious and curious to know what he had done suddenly we heard the sound of his trumpet and we were much surprised that instead of coming from below as we had expected it came from the village behind us what did that mean it was a mystery to us but the same idea struck us all that he had been killed and that the prussians were blowing the trumpet to draw us into an ambush we therefore returned to the cottage keeping a careful lookout with our fingers on the trigger and hiding under the branches but his wife in spite of our entreaties rushed on leaping like a tigress she thought that she had to avenge her husband and had fixed the bayonet to her rifle and we lost sight of her at the moment that we heard the trumpet again and a few moments later we heard her calling out to us come on come on he is alive it is he we hastened on and saw the captain smoking his pipe at the entrance of the village but strangely enough he was on horseback aha he said to us you see that there is something to be done here here i am on horseback already i knocked over a yulan yonder and took his horse i suppose they were guarding the wood but it was by drinking and swilling in clover one of them the sentry at the door had not time to see me before i gave him a sugar plum in his stomach and then before the others could come out i jumped onto the horse and was off like a shot eight or ten of them followed me i think but i took the crossroads through the woods i have got scratched and torn a bit but here i am and now my good fellows attention and take care those brigands will not rest until they have caught us and we must receive them with rifle bullets come along let us take up our posts we set out one of us took up his position a good way from the village of the crossroads i was posted at the entrance of the main street where the road from the level country enters the village while the two others the captain and his wife were in the middle of the village near the church whose tower served for an observatory and citadel we had not been in our places long before we heard a shot followed by another and then two then three the first was evidently a chasse 
one recognized it by the sharp report which sounds like the crack of a whip while the other three came from the lancers carbines the captain was furious he had given orders to the outpost to let the enemy pass and merely to follow them at a distance if they marched towards the village and to join me when they had gone well between the houses then they were to appear suddenly take the patrol between two fires and not allow a single man to escape for posted as we were the six of us could have hemmed in ten prussians if needful that confounded pied de has roused them the captain said and they will not venture to come on blindfold any longer and then i am quite sure that he has managed to get a shot into himself somewhere or other for we hear nothing of him it serves him right why did he not obey orders and then after a moment he grumbled in his beard after all i am sorry for the poor fellow he is so brave and shoots so well the captain was right in his conjectures we waited until evening without seeing the Ulans. They had retreated after the first attack, but unfortunately we had not seen Piedelo either. Was he dead or a prisoner? When night came, the captain proposed that we should go out and look for him, and so the three of us started. At the crossroads we found a broken rifle and some blood, while the ground was trampled down. But we did not find either a wounded man or a dead body, although we searched every thicket, and at midnight we returned without having discovered anything of our unfortunate comrade it is very strange the captain growled they must have killed him and thrown him into the bushes somewhere they cannot possibly have taken him prisoner as he would have called out for help i cannot understand it all just as he said that bright red flames shot up in the direction of the inn on the high road which illuminated the sky scoundrels cowards he shouted i'll bet they have set fire to the two houses on the market-place in order to have their revenge and then they will scuffle off without saying a word they will be satisfied with having killed a man and setting fire to two houses all right it shall not pass over like that we must go for them they will not like to leave their illuminations in order to fight it would be a great stroke of luck if we could set Piedelo free at the same time, someone said. The five of us set off full of rage and hope. In twenty minutes we had got to the bottom of the coulee, and we had not yet seen anyone when we had got within a hundred yards of the inn. The fire was behind the house, and so all that we saw of it was the reflection above the roof. However, we were walking rather slowly, as we were afraid of a trap when suddenly we heard piedelo's well-known voice it had a strange sound however for it was at the same time dull and vibrating stifled and clear as if he was calling out as loud as he could with a bit of rage stuffed into his mouth he seemed to be hoarse and panting and the unlucky fellow kept exclaiming help help we sent all thoughts of prudence to the devil, and in two bounds we were at the back of the inn, where a terrible sight met our eyes. 4. Piedelo was being burnt alive. He was writhing in the middle of a heap of faggots against a stake to which they had fastened him, and the flames were licking him with their sharp tongues. When he saw us, his tongue seemed to stick in his throat. He dropped his head and seemed as if he were going to die it was only the affair of a moment to upset the burning pile to scatter the embers and to cut the ropes that fastened him poor fellow in what a terrible state we found him the evening before he had had his left arm broken and it seemed as if he had been badly beaten since then for his whole body was covered with wounds bruises and blood the flames had also begun their work on him, and he had two large burns, one on his loins and the other on his right thigh, and his beard and his hair were scorched. Poor Piedelo! Nobody knows the terrible rage we felt at this sight. We would have rushed headlong at a hundred thousand Prussians. Our thirst for vengeance was intense 
the cowards had run away, leaving their crime behind them. Where could we find them now? Meanwhile, however, the captain's wife was looking after Piedelo and dressing his wounds as best she could, while the captain himself shook hands with him excitedly, and in a few minutes he came to himself. Good morning, captain. Good morning, all of you, he said. Ah, the scoundrels, the wretches. Why, twenty of them came to surprise us. Twenty, do you say? Yes, there was a whole band of them, and that is why I disobeyed orders, captain, and fired on them, for they would have killed you all, so I preferred to stop them. That frightened them and they did not venture to go further than the crossroads. They were such cowards. Four of them shot at me at twenty yards, as if I had been a target, and then they slashed me with their swords. My arm was broken so that I could only use my bayonet with one hand. But why did you not call for help? I took good care not to do that, for you would all have come, and you would neither have been able to defend me nor yourselves, being only five against twenty. You know that we should not have allowed you to have been taken, poor old fellow. I prefer to die by myself, don't you see? I did not want to bring you there, for it would have been a mere ambush. Well, we will not talk about it any more. Do you feel rather easier? No, I am suffocating. I know that I cannot live much longer, the brutes. They tied me to a tree and beat me till I felt half dead, and then they shook my broken arm. But I did not make a sound. I would rather have bitten my tongue out than have called out before them. Now I can say what I am suffering and shed tears. It does one good. Thank you, my kind friends. Poor Piedelo. But we will avenge you, you may be sure. Yes, yes, I want you to do that, especially there is a woman among them who passes as the wife of the lancer whom the captain killed yesterday. She is dressed like a lancer, and she tortured me the most yesterday and suggested burning me, and it was she who set fire to the wood. Oh, the wretch, the brute! Ah, how I am suffering! My loins, my arms! and he fell back panting and exhausted, writhing in his terrible agony, while the captain's wife wiped the perspiration from his forehead, and we all shed tears of grief and rage as if we had been children. I will not describe the end to you. He died half an hour later, but before that he told us in which direction the enemy had gone. When he was dead, we gave ourselves time to bury him, and then we set out in pursuit of them with our hearts full of fury and hatred. We will throw ourselves on the whole Prussian army, if it be needful, the captain said. But we will avenge Piedelo. We must catch those scoundrels. Let us swear to die rather than not to find them. And if I am killed first, these are my orders. All the prisoners that you make are to be shot immediately, and as for the lancer's wife, she is to be violated before she is put to death. She must not be shot, because she is a woman, the captain's wife said. If you survive, I am sure that you would not shoot a woman. Outraging her will be quite sufficient. But if you are killed in this pursuit, I want one thing, and that is to fight with her. I will kill her with my own hands, and the others can do what they like with her if she kills me. We will outrage her. We will burn her. We will tear her to pieces. Piedelo shall be avenged. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. 5. The next morning we unexpectedly fell on an outpost of Ulans, four leagues away. Surprised by our sudden attack, they were not able to mount their horses, nor even to defend themselves and in a few moments we had five prisoners, corresponding to our own number. The captain questioned them, and from their answers we felt certain that they were the same whom we had encountered the previous day. 
then a very curious operation took place one of us was told off to ascertain their sex and nothing can depict our joy when we discovered what we were seeking among them the female executioner who had tortured our friend the four others were shot on the spot with their backs towards us and close to the muzzles of our rifles and then we turned our attention to the woman what were we going to do with her i must acknowledge that we were all of us in favor of shooting her hatred and the wish to avenge piedelo had extinguished all pity in us and we had forgotten that we were going to shoot a woman but a woman reminded us of it the captain's wife at her entreaties therefore we determined to keep her prisoner the captain's poor wife was to be severely punished for this act of clemency the next day we heard that the armistice had been extended to the eastern part of france and we had to put an end to our little campaign two of us who belonged to the neighborhood returned home so there were only four of us all told the captain his wife and two men we belonged to besançon which was still being besieged in spite of the armistice let us stop here said the captain i cannot believe that the war is going to end like this the devil take it surely there are men still left in france and now is the time to prove what they are made of the spring is coming on and the armistice is only a trap laid for the prussians during the time that it lasts a new army will be formed and some fine morning we shall fall upon them again we shall be ready and we have a hostage let us remain here we fixed our quarters there it was terribly cold and we did not go out much and somebody had always to keep the female prisoner in sight she was sullen and never said anything or else spoke of her husband whom the captain had killed she looked at him continually with fierce eyes and we felt that she was tortured by a wild longing for revenge that seemed to us to be the most suitable punishment for the terrible torments that she had made piedelo suffer for impotent vengeance is such intense pain alas we who knew how to avenge our comrade ought to have thought that this woman would know how to avenge her husband and have been on our guard it is true that one of us kept watch every night and that at first we tied her by a long rope to the great oak bench that was fastened to the wall but by and by as she had never tried to escape in spite of her hatred for us we relaxed our extreme prudence and allowed her to sleep somewhere else except on the bench and without being tied what had we to fear she was at the end of the room a man was on guard at the door and between her and the sentinel the captain's wife and two other men used to lie she was alone and unarmed against four so there could be no danger one night when we were asleep and the captain was on guard the lancer's wife was lying more quietly in her corner than usual and she had even smiled for the first time since she had been our prisoner during the evening suddenly however in the middle of the night we were all awakened by a terrible cry we got up groping about and scarcely were we up when we stumbled over a furious couple who were rolling about and fighting on the ground it was the captain and the lancer's wife we threw ourselves on to them and separated them in a moment she was shouting and laughing and he seemed to have the death rattle all this took place in the dark two of us held her and when a light was struck a terrible sight met our eyes the captain was lying on the floor in a pool of blood with an enormous wound in his throat and his sword bayonet that had been taken from his rifle was sticking in the red gaping wound a few minutes afterwards he died without having been able to utter a word his wife did not shed a tear her eyes were dry her throat was contracted and she looked at the lancer's wife steadfastly and with a calm ferocity that inspired fear this woman belongs to me she said to us suddenly you swore to me not a week ago to let me kill her as i chose if she killed my husband and you must keep your oath 
you must fasten her securely to the fireplace upright against the back of it and then you can go where you like but far from here i will take my revenge on her to myself leave the captain's body and we three he she and i will remain here we obeyed and went away she promised to write to us to geneva as we were returning there six two days later i received the following letter dated the day after we had left and that had been written at an inn on the high road my friend i am writing to you according to my promise for the moment i am at the inn where i have just handed my prisoner over to a prussian officer i must tell you my friend that this poor woman has left two children in germany she had followed her husband whom she adored as she did not wish him to be exposed to the risks of war by himself and as her children were with their grandparents i have learnt all this since yesterday and it has turned my ideas of vengeance into more humane feelings at the very moment when i felt pleasure in insulting this woman and in threatening her with the most fearful torments in recalling piedelo who had been burnt alive and in threatening her with a similar death she looked at me coldly and said what have you got to reproach me with frenchwoman you think that you will do right in avenging your husband's death is not that so yes i replied very well then in killing him i did what you are going to do in burning me i avenged my husband for your husband killed him well i replied as you approve of this vengeance prepare to endure it i do not fear it and in fact she did not seem to have lost courage her face was calm and she looked at me without trembling while i brought wood and dried leaves together and feverishly threw on to them the powder from some cartridges which was to make her funeral pile the more cruel i hesitated in my thoughts of persecution for a moment but the captain was there pale and covered with blood and he seemed to be looking at me with his large glassy eyes and i applied myself to my work again after kissing his pale lips suddenly however on raising my head i saw that she was crying and i felt rather surprised so you are frightened i said to her no but when i saw you kiss your husband i thought of mine of all whom i love she continued to sob but stopping suddenly she said to me in broken words and in a low voice have you any children a shiver ran over me for i guessed that this poor woman had some she asked me to look in a pocket-book which was in her bosom and in it i saw two photographs of quite young children a boy and a girl with those kind gentle chubby faces that german children have in it there were also two locks of light hair and a letter in a large childish hand and beginning with german words which meant my dear little mother i could not restrain my tears my dear friend and so i untied her and without venturing to look at the face of my poor dead husband who was not to be avenged i went with her as far as the inn she is free i have just left her and she kissed me with tears i am going upstairs to my husband come as soon as possible my dear friend to look for our two bodies i set off with all speed and when i arrived there was a prussian patrol at the cottage and when i asked what it all meant i was told that there was a captain of franc tireurs and his wife inside both dead i gave their names they saw that i knew them and i begged to be allowed to undertake their funeral somebody has already undertaken it was the reply go in if you wish to as you knew them you can settle about their funeral with their friend i went in the captain and his wife were lying side by side on a bed and were covered by a sheet i raised it and saw that the woman had inflicted a similar wound in her throat to that from which her husband had died at the side of the bed there sat watching and weeping the woman who had been mentioned to me as their best friend it was 
the lancer's wife end of section 33 recording by james k white chula vista Section 34 of the Works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume 3, by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Colonel's Ideas Upon my word, Colonel Laporte said, I am old and gouty. My legs are as stiff as two pieces of wood. And yet, if a pretty woman were to tell me to go through the eye of a needle... I believe I should take a jump at it, like a clown through a hoop. I shall die like that. It is in the blood. I am an old beau, one of the old school, and the sight of a woman, a pretty woman, stirs me to the tips of my toes. There. And then we are all very much alike in France. We remain cavaliers, cavaliers of love and fortune, since God has been abolished whose bodyguard we really were. But nobody will ever get a woman out of our hearts. There she is, and there she will remain. And we love her, and shall continue to love her, and go on committing all kinds of frolics on her account, as long as there is a France on the map of Europe. And even if France were to be wiped off the map, there would always be Frenchmen left. When I am in the presence of a woman, of a pretty woman, I feel capable of anything. By Jove, when I feel her looks penetrating me, her confounded looks which set your blood on fire, I should like to do I don't know what, to fight a duel, to have a row, to smash the furniture, in order to show that I am the strongest, the bravest, the most daring, and the most devoted of men. But I am not the only one, certainly not. The whole French army is like me. That I will swear to you. From the common soldier to the general, we all go forward, and to the very end, when there is a woman in the case, a pretty woman. Remember what Joan of Arc made us do formerly. Come, I will make a bet that if a pretty woman had taken command of the army on the eve of Sedan, when Marshal McMahon was wounded, we should have broken through the Prussian lines, by Jove, and have had a drink out of their guns. It was not Trochu but saint genevieve who was required in paris and i remember a little anecdote of the war which proves that we are capable of everything in the presence of a woman i was a captain a simple captain at the time and i was in command of a detachment of scouts who were retreating through a district which swarmed with prussians we were surrounded pursued tired out and half dead with fatigue and hunger and by the next day we were bound to reach bar sur -Tain. Otherwise we should be done for, cut off from the main body and killed. I do not know how we managed to escape so far. However, we had ten leagues to go during the night, ten leagues through the snow, and with empty stomachs. And I thought to myself, it is all over. My poor devils of fellows will never be able to do it we had eaten nothing since the day before and the whole day long we remained hidden in a barn and huddled close together so as not to feel the cold so much we did not venture to speak or even move and we slept by fits and starts like one sleeps when one is worn out with fatigue it was dark by five o'clock that wan darkness caused by the snow and i shook my men some of them would not get up they were almost incapable of moving or of standing upright and their joints were stiff from the cold and want of motion in front of us there was a large expanse of flat bare country the snow was still falling like a curtain in large white flakes which concealed everything under a heavy thick frozen mantle a mattress of ice one might have thought that it was the end of the world come my lads let us start they looked at the thick white dust which was coming down, and they seemed to think, We have had enough of this. We may just as well die here. Then I took out my revolver and said, I will shoot the first man who flinches. And so they set off, 
but very slowly, like men whose legs were of very little use to them. And I sent four of them three hundred yards ahead to scout, and the others followed pell-mell, walking at random and without any order. I put the strongest in the rear, with orders to quicken the pace of the sluggards with the points of their bayonets, in the back. The snow seemed as if it were going to bury us alive. It powdered our kepis and cloaks without melting, and made phantoms of us, a species of specters of dead soldiers, who were very tired, and I said to myself, we shall never get out of this, except by a miracle. Sometimes we had to stop for a few minutes, on account of those who could not follow us, and then we heard nothing except the falling snow, that vague, almost indiscernible sound which all those flakes make as they come down together. Some of the men shook themselves, but others did not move, and so I gave the order to set off again. They shouldered their rifles, and with weary feet we set out, when suddenly the scouts fell back. Something had alarmed them. They had heard voices in front of them, and so I sent six men and a sergeant on ahead, and waited. All at once a shrill cry, a woman's cry, pierced through the heavy silence of the snow and in a few minutes they brought back two prisoners, an old man and a girl, and I questioned them in a low voice. They were escaping from the Prussians who had occupied their house during the evening, and who had got drunk. The father had become alarmed on his daughter's account, and without even telling their servants they had made their escape into the darkness. I saw immediately that they belonged to the upper classes, and, as I should have done in any case, I invited them to come with us, and we started off together and as the old man knew the road, he acted as our guide. It had ceased snowing. The stars appeared, and the cold became intense. The girl, who was leaning on her father's arm, walked wearily and with jerks, and several times she murmured, I have no feeling at all in my feet. And I suffered more than she did, I believe, to see that poor little woman dragging herself like that through the snow. But suddenly she stopped and said, Father, I am so tired that I cannot go any further. The old man wanted to carry her, but he could not even lift her up, and she fell on the ground with a deep sigh. We all came round her, and as for me, I stamped on the ground, not knowing what to do, and quite unable to make up my mind to abandon that man and girl like that, when suddenly one of the soldiers, a Parisian, whom they had nicknamed Pratique, said, Come, comrades, we must carry the young lady. Otherwise we shall not show ourselves Frenchmen, confound it. I really believed that I swore with pleasure and said, That is very good of you, my children, and I will take my share of the burden. We could indistinctly see the trees of a little wood on the left through the darkness, and several men went into it and soon came back with a bundle of branches twisted into a litter. "'Who will lend his cloak? It is for a pretty girl, comrades,' Pratique said, and ten cloaks were thrown to him. In a moment the girl was lying warm and comfortable among them, and was raised upon six shoulders. I placed myself at their head, on the right, and very pleased I was with my charge. We started off much more briskly, as if we had been having a drink of wine, and I even heard a few jokes. A woman is quite enough to electrify Frenchmen, you see. The soldiers, who were reanimated and warm, had almost reformed their ranks, and an old fraucheur, who was following the litter, waiting for his turn to replace the first of his comrades who might give in, said to one of his neighbors, loud enough for me to hear, I am not a young man now, but by... Blank, there is nothing like the women to make you feel queer from head to foot. We went on, almost without stopping, until three o'clock in the morning, when suddenly our scouts fell back again, and soon the whole detachment showed nothing but a vague shadow on the ground, as the men lay on the snow, and I gave my orders in a low voice and heard the harsh metallic sound of the cocking of rifles, for there, in the middle of the plain, some strange object was moving about. It might have been taken for some enormous animal running about, which unfolded itself like a serpent, or came together into a coil, 
suddenly went quickly to the right or left, stopped, and then went on again. But presently that wandering shape came near, and I saw a dozen lancers, one behind the other, who were trying to find their way which they had lost. They were so near by that time that I could hear the panting of the horses, the clink of their swords, and the creaking of their saddles, and so cried, FIRE! Fifty rifle shots broke the stillness of the night, then there were four or five reports, and at last one single shot was heard, and when the smoke had cleared away, we saw that the twelve men and nine horses had fallen. Three of the animals were galloping away at a furious pace, and one of them was dragging the body of its rider, which rebounded from the ground in a terrible manner, whose foot had caught in the stirrup behind it. One of the soldiers behind me gave a terrible laugh and said, There are a number of widows there. Perhaps he was married. And a third added, It did not take long. A head was put out of the litter. What is the matter? she asked. You are fighting. It is nothing, mademoiselle, I replied. We have got rid of a dozen Prussians. Poor fellows she said. But as she was cold, she quickly disappeared beneath the cloaks again, and we started off once more. We marched on for a long time, and at last the sky began to grow pale. The snow became quite clear, luminous and bright, and a rosy tint appeared in the east. And suddenly a voice in the distance cried, Who goes there? The whole detachment halted and I advanced to say who we were. We had reached the French lines, and as my men defiled before the outpost, a commandant on horseback, whom I had informed of what had taken place, asked in a sonorous voice as he saw the litter pass him, What have you there? And immediately a small head, covered with light hair, appeared, disheveled and smiling, and replied, It is I, monsieur. At this the men raised a hearty laugh, and we felt quite light-hearted, while Pratique, who was walking by the side of the litter, waved his kepi and shouted, Vive la France! And I felt really moved. I do not know why, except that I thought it a pretty and gallant thing to say. It seemed to me as if we had just saved the whole of France, and had done something that other men could not have done, something simple and really patriotic. I shall never forget that little face, you may be sure, and if I had to give my opinion about abolishing drums, trumpets, and bugles, I should propose to replace them in every regiment by a pretty girl, and that would be even better than playing the Marseillaise. By Jove, it would put some spirit into a trooper to have a Madonna like that, a living Madonna, by the colonel's side. He was silent for a few moments, and then continued, with an air of conviction, and jerking his head, all the same, we are very fond of women, we Frenchmen. End of section 34. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista.